So just roll, Mona. Just okay. Just but like just talk and. I look okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, remember to keep your eye on your exit. Mm hmm Yeah. If it's not too awkward. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll let you do your open mic kind of thing. If you okay. Yourself and, and what you're doing, you know, if you, if you want to also put in your background. Yeah, yeah, I can. And see what you do. And then when I ask you the questions, I'll just ask you to answer and complete. Yeah. Answer, and reframe it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hi, my name is Rachel Lloyd, and I'm the founder and president of GEMS, Girls Educational and Mentoring Services. Uh, I founded GEMS in 1998. I came to the U.S. in 1997, um, originally working as a missionary with adult women coming out of the sex industry. And within the first few weeks of, of getting to New York and going to Rikers Island and going out to Hunts Point and on the streets, I began to meet really young girls, uh, 12, 13, 14 year old girls, some of whom were in an adult prison um, and had been told to say that they were 17, 18, 19 by their pimps and children literally on the streets of New York who were being bought and sold um, by adult men to adult men. And I was 22 when I came here. At the time, I'd gotten out of the sex industry myself when I was 19. And so, you know, had only been out really three years, but really just saw so much of my own experiences in the girls that I was meeting, even though the, uh, you know, we were from completely different countries and cultures and continents. Our stories of growing up, you know, with a, with a challenging, family life and a dysfunctional kind of home, um, our stories of, you know, running away or, or meeting somebody who we thought could make things better for us, our stories of, you know, the shame and the stigma that accompanied our experiences in the commercial sex industry looked the same, despite the fact that when I was exploited, it was in uh, Europe and, and the girls I was meeting were, were being exploited in the Bronx and Brooklyn and East New York and all over the city. Um, and so I just felt a really strong connection to these, these little girls and young women that I was meeting. And I didn't have a lot to offer at the time. Um, all I could really say was I got out and you can too. And I would share my story and talk about my experiences with my pimp. And at the time I didn't even really understand that that had been a pimp. I didn't have the language for that, but I knew I'd had a really abusive boyfriend who'd taken my money every night. And then fairly quickly within the first few months, I began to have a context and, a, and an understanding of what had actually happened to me. Um, and I was able to, to share that and relate that to the girls and young women I was working with. And so a year after getting here, I started GEMS and literally started on my kitchen table and girls were sleeping on my couch and eating my food and borrowing my clothes and never bringing them back. And you know, the, those first kind of couple of years was, there were no resources. I mean, the way that girls were treated um, in the criminal justice system, by service providers, by the child welfare system, I mean, they were seen as teen prostitutes. Um, they were seen as bad girls, dirty girls, you know, girls who'd made a choice, uh, despite the fact that they were 11, 12, 13 years old. And so I felt compelled um, to start something for them. And I didn't know enough to really know about kind of a, a nonprofit. So I taught myself um, and I learned about budgeting and, and program planning and all of those kind of things. And so, you know, 18 years on, uh, 
GEMS is the largest service provider to sexually commercially sexually exploited and domestically trafficked girls and young women. We serve girls and young women ages 12 to 24. Last year we served uh, 437 girls and young women, which is a, a far cry from, you know, the 10 girls I was serving year one in, in my one bedroom apartment. Um, we actually have housing now for girls so that they don't have to sleep at my house anymore. And we've been able to create a really comprehensive program um, for girls and young women and simultaneously change the way that trafficked girls, uh, particularly low-income girls of color, particularly uh, girls who've been in the child welfare system, girls who've been in the juvenile justice system, girls who don't warrant very high on anybody's priority list. We've been able to change the way that those girls are seen and treated within the system and within culture. Um, and so that's been kind of the journey of GEMS over the last 18 years. I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've been able to do with our young women and, and really feel incredibly blessed that I've been able to take my own experiences and turn them into something uh, positive and something that is really about, you know, empowering the next generation of girls and young women. That's amazing. Well, you brought the, the end of my questions to the forefront, which is the hallelujah end of your, your own personal hero's journey. Can you tell me at what age you left home and why and then what mm -hmm. happened to you? So I, I grew up in England. I grew up in a home where, you know, for a few years I had a lot of support from my single mother and we were, you know, incredibly poor. You don't realize that then um, when you're a kid, but when you look back, you realize, you know, that you were actually really, really struggling. Um, but, you know, I had support from my mother and my grandmother. Um, my mother married uh, a man when I was 10. Um, and that changed everything. Um, he was abusive, he was an alcoholic, and, and it didn't take long before my mother was drinking very, very heavily. And so, you know, when you grow up in a home with, with rampant, hardcore alcoholism, I mean, it changes, and, and domestic violence, it completely changes, you know, how you see yourself, how you see adults, how you see the world. Um, and so by 13, I dropped out of school. I was uh, working full time in restaurants and factories. I worked at a variety of factories in my town. And, and I grew up in a town, uh, Portsmouth, that you know has a, a really high unemployment rate and an incredibly high poverty rate, a high teen pregnancy rate. I mean, it's not an ideal town for any young person to grow up in. Um, and so, you know, the, the environmental factors in my community, in the city, and, and what was happening to, to young people at that time where I was growing up, combined with the, the family dynamics of, of violence and, and alcoholism and all kinds of insanity that was happening at home, um, just really put me kind of on that high risk path. I can remember uh, our family GP telling me when I was about 14 maybe, that by the time I was 16, I would be pregnant, in jail, on drugs, or dead, or a combination of <laughs> the four. Um, and so, right, I mean, I was, I was fairly quickly identified as one of those kids who, you know, whose life trajectory was gonna be, you know, filled with, bad statistics and and problems and you know the the my my future was was pretty well predetermined in terms of it being a failure and and having a lot of you know bad things happen in the future and so you know when you're being told that by the adults around you and and you're being told that you know there's there's no hope for you um you begin to believe that and so you know I, and you are also living as a child in a very adult world i mean i was working in a nightclub you know as a bartender i was working in a factory as a line supervisor um and so i was meeting guys who were adult men um i was 13 14 dating men in their 20s 30s and and you think at the time that you're 
you're ready for that and that you, you know, you're mature and, and you know what you're doing. And then you look back as an adult and you realize how vulnerable you were and how much these men around you took took real advantage of, of the fact you were a child. Um, I ended up uh, leaving England. I'd already left home by the time I was about 13. Yeah, um, I left England when I was 17 just in search of, of something better. I'd met some girls in a pub one night and they said they were going to Germany and there was jobs and it was great and you could make money and you know our town and our country had hit a really bad recession at that time and I was trying to get away from yet another awful boyfriend and so I got on a bus and which led to a ferry which led to another 10 buses and ended up in in Munich in Germany and within the first few weeks realized that I didn't have any of the skills i.e speaking German which was kind of really important in that country um, that were going to help me get a job. And so uh, probably three weeks in, um, completely broke and no way to get back. I'd gotten a one-way ticket in my infinite wisdom as a teenager. Um, and so I went and applied for a job at a bar. And I'd been told that girls could just, you know, drink with the customers and I know it was a strip club, but I figured if I didn't dance and I didn't take my clothes off, all I had to do was drink with the customers. And I learned really quickly that first day that there was a lot more to it. And I, I was able to pay um, for the bed and breakfast that I was staying in and not get kicked out. And so, you know, I figured if I just, you know, gritted my teeth and managed to get through for a few weeks, um, I could, you know, get one way, another ticket back home and forget any of this had ever happened. And I think there's a line that you cross when you enter the commercial sex industry, um, particularly for those of us who've been sexually abused, uh, who've experienced sexual assault, which I had, uh, uh, you know, various ages, multiple times growing up, and then particularly as a teenager. And so you begin to think, well, this has been, you know, taken from me. I haven't had any choice in the matter. I've been, you know, completely sexualized and objectified and exploited already. At least this time I'm getting paid for it. At least this time I get to say, there's a line from, from Pretty Woman uh, where she says, you know, I get to say when, I get to say how, I get to say how much. Um, and there's this false sense of control that comes, I, I think, in those initial kind of weeks and, and months in the commercial sex industry where you begin to believe that you are operating from a place of control where you believe that this is who you are, this is what you're destined for because of all the experiences that have led up to this and that have taught you that your, your body doesn't have value, you don't have value, your only value comes from your sexuality, um, you know, all the lessons that you've learned as a child come into play. And I mean, it's it's no mistake that, you know, 70 to 90 percent, I mean, there's numerous studies about this, 70 to 90 percent of both adults and children who end up in the sex industry were sexually abused prior to recruitment. Um, because it really is, and, and Andrea Dworkin once said, that incest is boot camp for prostitution. Um, so there really is like that, that kind of grooming um, period where you begin to believe that this is who you are. And so it wasn't long before I met a guy, which is how most stories uh, both begin and end. I met a man um, who was my boyfriend initially, um, who I loved very much and who fairly quickly uh, began to tell me that, you know, initially it was he needed to borrow some money and then not long in it became very clear that that wasn't like an optional thing and that if I didn't give him money um, there would be violence at the end of it that I had to come home turn over my money um, he was using crack at the time which I also didn't realize and so right that relationship very very quickly turned incredibly violent and I felt trapped. I made arrangements for my body to be shipped home to England because I 
was absolutely convinced that I was going to die at, I think at that point, 18. Um, you know, I'd left a key for somebody because if I don't come to work at the strip club for a few days, it'll be him, his way to contact my mother. I mean, I, you know, I was resigned to the idea that, that my life was going to be over that year. Um, and miraculously, obviously, it wasn't. Um, and I, I managed to, to get out, and that story is far too long and, and complicated. But I mean, essentially, you know, I, I came into contact with a church um, that was on an American military base. I'd gone to a funeral and met a woman, and she kind of just kept reaching out. Um, and I didn't have anybody reaching out to me at that time. I didn't have anybody who was showing me any kind of kindness or love. And, you know, my, my pimp um, tried to kill me multiple times. Um, and each time it was kind of, again, a miracle that I survived. And so uh, I got out with the help of a church and I got a job as a nanny. Um, and was incredibly traumatized uh, for the first kind of year and right didn't know it was PTSD and didn't know what all the nightmares and the you know kind of daytime nightmares and all of the things that were happening to me I didn't I didn't have a context for that I didn't tell anybody other than uh, you know I had an abusive boyfriend I didn't tell anybody about the sex industry I didn't tell anybody about the pimping and the exploitation and and all the things that I'd gone through um, because I knew that people would judge me. And so, you know, while there was there was a lot of support in the church for kind of, right, the, the basics and, right, they gave me clothes and they gave me food and they gave me a job and as a nanny I had somewhere to live. Um, but I still had this big piece of me that was kind of hidden and that I was continually struggling with kind of the after effects of the trauma. So, you know, when I created GEMS, it was really about how do I, how do we support girls in the ways that I did get from the church, right? A community, the practical stuff, employment, clothes, etc. But how do I also make sure that they have the things that I didn't have? Somebody to relate to, somebody who can say, it's all right, I've been there too. Somebody to say, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Um, you know, you've been taken advantage of. Here's why you were so vulnerable in the first place. Here's all the risk factors that played into making you, you know, so incredibly vulnerable. And, and what you're experiencing is PTSD and trauma bonding and all of those things and, and an environment that would re really address that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think my experiences uh, are just obviously my individual experiences and, and one person's story is never, you know, a, a representation of an entire issue. But there are, there are many pieces of my story um, that are very, very similar to, to many of the girls and young women that we serve and, and that we see around the country. Um, you know, there are real risk factors that make young people vulnerable in the first place. Um, and it is really hard once you are in to get out. Um, you feel trapped, you feel stuck. Uh, you feel like this person, your pimp, your trafficker, your exploiter will find you and kill you. And he is omnipotent and, and all seeing and all knowing and he is God. And if you try to leave, he will find you and track you down. And I believed that for a long time. Um, and then there's the, the shame that comes when you leave and being in like the square, wor the square world um, around regular people in that, that period where you don't feel normal for a really long time. Um, and you think it's, you know, there's something, you've got a big red X on your forehead and everyone can tell that, you know, you were this terrible, shameful person. Um, and, and the truth is that society and family and, and employers and all of those people do judge you um, and, and do shame you. And so, uh, you know, our work has, has been both about addressing the individual impact on girls and young women, but also about changing the society and the culture and the systems that impact them um, so that their experiences getting out and, and staying out look really, really different. Yeah. <clears throat>
When I first began this work in 1997, I had, there was there was no kind of discussion about whether girls and young women, um, even children as young as 11, 12 years old, were victims in any way. They were seen very clearly as criminals, and they were criminalized by. Uh, the adult criminal justice system, by the, the juvenile justice system, you could be charged and arrested um, with an act of prostitution. That, in New York State, you couldn't even legally consent to sex until you were 17, and yet somehow, if money was exchanged, you could miraculously consent to sex um, at 12. And so a big part of our work was about shifting that, the, the initial criminalization, because if we continued as a society and as systems to not just view girls as criminals, but to treat them as criminals, um, how, how would girls ever heal? How would they ever leave? How would they ever have the resources and accesses? And how would they ever believe that this was something that was done to them and not who they were? Um, and so we worked incredibly hard for, for about four and a half years on legislation called the Safe Harbor for Exploited Youth Act. And we changed that legislation. Uh, we passed that legislation in 2008. It went into effect in, into effect in 2010. And it's been, it was the first piece of legislation that shifted um, the focus from seeing children as willing participants in their own victimization to actually victims, to sexually exploited, to trafficked, something that had happened to them. Um, so that kind of shifting to the idea that girls are victims, they don't deserve this, they're victims just like international trafficking victims are. Um, and we'd begun to see in 2000 uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act passed. And so there was beginning to be this idea, okay, we recognize that girls are being brought in from Ukraine and from Thailand and from Mexico, and these girls and women are totally victims. But those other girls, those American girls, you know, they're just, you know, being prostitutes. They want this. They like it. If they wanted to get a job, they could. Um, and so shifting that piece has been huge, but you also don't want to leave people at that perpetual victim stage. It's really unhealthy for for victims, for survivors to, to see themselves as a perpetual victim or for society to see that. And so our program model is actually called Victim Survivor Leader. And it's really about this trajectory of, of supporting girls through and, and young women through each stage and shifting this idea that, you know, y you don't have to stay as, as like this super traumatized victim for the rest of your life who doesn't have anything to offer, who doesn't have anything to, to give to society. Um, and so helping girls move from victim to survivor and then survivor to leader um, has been and continues to be a, a huge piece of our programmatic model, but it's also shifting that idea in society too. And so ensuring that survivors are seen as more than our stories. We have an entire traveling photo exhibition that goes around the country called More Than a Survivor, More Than a Story, um, to really help people recognize that there are survivors who are doing all kinds of incredible things um, in the world and that no one is defined by their trauma, that no one is simply you know, kind of just this story. One of my friends says, my story is still being written. And and so that idea that we are just like our trauma story and nothing more than that, and that we are not, you know, capable and competent and smart and have the ability to change things, not just in the anti-trafficking movement or the commercial sexual exploitation fight, 
But I've got two young women who are in pre-med. Um, one is in her second year, one is in her first year. They're going to be doctors. Um, they may or may not work with victims, work with victims of trafficking, um, but they're gonna be two incredible uh, young women, two black young women who are going to be doctors and who will make changes in their field just by virtue of who they are. Um, and so ensuring that we're able to see uh, survivors of commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking as far more than just that um, is really kind of the, the next 10, 20 years of, of this fight. understand what makes these girls get into it what's the relationship like where are they coming from i know you touched upon it in the mm -hmm. story where they actually go into the street they find this kind of mm -hmm. father figure yeah they begin to exploit exploit them where are they mm -hmm. coming from it's just so common and it could happen to you know 60 percent of the population more So I think one of the, the common questions is kind of how do girls end up getting into the life? How do they get exploited and trafficked? And, and what we know um, is that while it can happen to anyone, and, and just by virtue of being a child, right? Just by virtue of being 12, 13 years old and having a 25-year-old, 30-year-old man tell you that you're beautiful and you know whether that's through the internet and luring you in through the internet or you know walking down the street um meeting you at a mall uh girls at that age are incredibly vulnerable they're children they're incredibly vulnerable to adults who are our predators um and and this is something that we know and get when it comes to kind of sexual abuse and sexual assault um, but seem to forget when it comes to, to victims of trafficking and then the blame gets put back on them. Like, why didn't they, you know, make better choices? Well, when a 30-year-old man with a nice car rolls up and invites you out for dinner and tells you you're amazing um, and, and spends time, right? Some of these pimps will spend weeks and months and, you know, to, to groom, to lure the victims in. And we know that this is predatory behavior and we see that with with child molesters and abusers, you know, kind of across the board and, and pimps are no different in, in that case. So it could happen to anyone. But what we know is that it overwhelmingly happens to, to girls, young women, boys and transgender youth who are already vulnerable, who've already experienced prior trauma. Again, 70 to 90% of both adults and children uh, were victims of, of child sexual abuse prior to their recruitment. So you learn a lot of lessons through those experiences. You learn that your body is not your own, that you know, shame and secrecy and, and you know, devaluing of who you are outside of your sexuality. You learn, you know, the fear and, and reward are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, and so pimps are able to, to pick up on that and, you know, study uh, girls and young women and be able to kind of pull out um, the vulnerability and hone in on that vulnerability. Um, if you add in domestic violence, if you add in substance abuse in the home, if you add in emotional and, and physical abuse growing up, those numbers go from, you know, a potential 70 to 90 percent to like over 90 percent easily. Um, and so uh, the young people that we see being recruited have already experienced, you know, seeing violence as love. Um, in their households, they've they've grown up in situations where they've been the caretaker. They've been the one who has to fix everything and and make sure you know there's food in the house because mommy's too high to be able to get anything. So right, they've had those experiences, and again, pimps are really good, uh, unfortunately, at being able to pull on what those vulnerabilities are. Um, 
you know, we see young people who have been in the child welfare system. I mean, any time you're in the child welfare system and you're removed from your home, and obviously there's been trauma in the home, and then the child welfare system is not set up and, and fails our young people in many, many ways. Um, oh, sorry. No, caffeine actually helps weirdly, um, or at least I believe it does. I, maybe it doesn't. Okay. I convinced myself that it does. Ah. Oh. All right. Mm -hmm. Things you don't expect to happen to you in your life. You want a Coke? Yeah, I'll take some caffeine. We're, we're almost done. No, it's okay. Sorry. I articulated almost everything I wanted to ask you. Do you feel like you got um, okay? Yeah. All right. So I'm good. Like we'll keep going. Um, you articulated the answer to that question? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the child welfare piece okay. and... Um, yeah, I'm gonna say a couple more things. I mean, I know you're gonna cut it, so. Okay. So over 70% of the girls and young women uh, that GEM serves have been in the child welfare system at some point. And obviously involvement in the child welfare system demonstrates that there has been problems at home um, and trauma and abuse and neglect and whatever that looks like. And then the child welfare system is not really set up to effectively support and serve young people. We have, in, in New York City, we have thousands and thousands of young people uh, in the child welfare system and kids at that age, as, as small children, as teenagers need homes. They need parents or they need a, a healthy supportive adult who loves them and so in the absence of that when an adult man comes along again who who is specifically looking for vulnerable girls I mean that's his whole job is to recruit is to to make that person loyal is to be able to you know lure her in um, and get her to a point where she turns over the money every single night and, and doesn't question it, um, where he doesn't always need to use violence. He'll, he'll use violence, um, you know, as, as, a, as a warning sometimes or as a, but I mean, if you are good at what you do, you don't need to inflict violence on someone every single day. You, you can use, you know, the threat reward piece. You can use the threat of violence. You can use the, you've been really good this week and you've made a lot of money, so I'm gonna take you out for dinner. And, you know, the other girls have to stay home because, right, pimps often have multiple girls in the house. And so keeping that, you know, that competition and that like, you're special and I'm gonna prioritize you. I, I worked with a girl years ago who, you know, we were talking about her pimp, and, and I was trying to say, you know, it, this is exploitive, and I see you really in pain and sad and bruises and all of these things. And she said, yeah, but, I, you know, I know he loves me. And I said, well, 
how do you know that? And she said, he lets me sit in the front, side, front seat of the car. And I was like, God, like sitting in the front seat of the car? That's enough for this kid. But this kid had had years and years and years of trauma and abuse from her mother, from her stepfather, from right everybody around her. She'd been in the child welfare system. She'd run away at 12, 13 because things were so bad. And so this adult man who let her sit in the front seat of the car and all the other girls had to sit in the back, that was proof to her that she was special and she was loved. And so what, what girls and, and young women, and again, boys and, and trans youth need is adults who show them love in a healthy way, in a, in a way that says, I don't want anything from you. There's nothing you can do for me that, that is in exchange for this unconditional love and support that I'm giving you. Um, and, and when young people have that, they thrive. And so, you know, it's critical for us to be able to identify young people so much sooner than, because pimps are identifying them, traffickers are identifying them. And, and for our systems and our schools and our communities and our churches and all of these places where young people are, till they're 12, 13, 14 years old, we're letting kids slip through the cracks and we're seeing kids who we know have domestic violence in the home, who we know have been removed from their home, who we know have had, you know, come into school with bruises, but we don't really want to, you know, dig too deep. And so these kids just keep falling through the cracks until the day where there is a guy who says, I'll pay attention to you, I'll love you, I'll create a home and a family for you. You know, I won't kick you out, I won't treat you like your mother did. And so for some of our young people, the way that the pimp treats them and, and the love that he shows them is far more compelling than anything that has happened to them in their lives. And that's not, I have to explain to my girls, the fact that you feel like you get more love from your pimp and, and life is better at your pimp's house and you know, you've know you got family with these other girls and this pimp, that's not a reflection of what a great guy this pimp is. It's a reflection and an indictment of how poorly and how terribly you've been treated by every adult in your life up to this point. And so if we're gonna really address the issue of commercial sexual exploitation, we have to recognize it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It, it isn't an issue of like poor little girls and bad men. It's an issue of right systemic failures. It's an issue of poverty and young people growing up in poverty and, and right, and in major cities and in a lot of places around the country, that's linked with race. Um, it's really hard to separate out race and class in a lot of places. And while that looks really different in somewhere like Appalachia, um, in New York City, overwhelmingly, that looks like kids of color. And so, right, we, we are throwing away entire segments of our children and of our young people and then wondering how come you got into the sex industry? How come you ended up under the control of a pimp? How come you didn't just leave? I mean, where would they go when everywhere in their life has been bad and scary and unhappy? And so, yeah, it's bad and scary and unhappy with this pimp, but at least I know what to expect. At least this is somebody who says he loves me. And, and so that trauma bonding piece for our young people is able to happen because of all the failures that have happened in their life to that point. Okay, we're almost done. I'm just gonna ask you one more question. And then after you answer that question, hopefully you don't, your mind will stay intact. <laughs> um, and then we're just gonna film just a little bit of B-roll with you just looking at this camera side. Mm -hmm. And that one question is actually a positive thing. How has your personal experience turned into a blessing in a way where you're feeling that? I am. Uh, incredibly grateful to do this work every day. Um, I think working with young people and impacting girls and young women for, for me and my work is, is an honor and a privilege. And, you know, I, I know that my experiences growing up and the things that I went through 
have been able to impact um, other girls and, and young women in a way that, and, and, and this isn't to discount, we've got some amazing staff at GEMS and there's amazing women all around the country and men who are doing this work who, who aren't necessarily survivors and, or survivors specifically of commercial sexual exploitation. Most people in life are survivors of something. Um, but there is something very specific that being a survivor brings to this work. And so, you know, being able to have conversations with young people and say, I, I totally know what that was like. I know what it was like to think that I was never gonna, you know, be able to escape my pimp. I was never gonna be able to get over him. I was never gonna be able to feel normal again, but I do, and, and it gets better. Right? I mean, that's what our young people need to hear um, across the board. It gets better. It doesn't stay like this forever. And so being able to model, you know, being a healthy adult and being honest about the challenges in getting there um, and challenges that we all still face, right? But being able to say, you know, there is life after the life that what you think is 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 life right now and what you think is your future right now, you will be amazed at the experiences you will have later in life. You will be, you will look back and think, I pinch yourself. And I mean, there are times over the last, even over the last few years, I mean, I've been out of the life since I was 19. I'm 41 um, now, so that's 22 years. And, and there's still times when I pinch myself and think, wow, I'm, in, I, I am incredibly lucky. I'm incredibly lucky to own a home, having been homeless for many periods in my life, to be able to have healthy relationships, to be able to, to feel good about myself and to, and to be, to know that I'm good at things and, you know, I'm capable and smart and all the things that people told me growing up that I would never be or that I was, you know, going to end up in jail or, I mean, I have and I got out and I'm doing pretty well, right? There is a, a happy ending um, for our young people. And, and I, I think what's been incredibly powerful to me is, you know, at this point of GEM's history, I mean, we're 18 years in, so there are girls who have grown up in the GEMS program and who came in at 12, 13, 14, who are now right in their mid to late 20s, um, who are in college, who are in pre-med, who are doing amazing things, who are working at GEMS. And so they get to be, you know, the role models um, for, for the, the younger and the newer girls coming in. So it's not just, you know, the Rachel Lloyd kind of success story, which, you know, would be unhelpful at a certain point and frankly, you know, a vanity project. Um, but it's really about this community of, of young women and adult women who have gone through these experiences who are all able to say, it gets better. I remember coming to GEMS. I remember sitting in group and being like, oh, I don't want to be here. I want to go back home to my pimp and why am I even here? And now, look, I'm in college. I just graduated college. We had eight girls graduate from college last semester. I've got 30-something uh, in college this semester. I mean, right, they are breaking barriers and and breaking chains and cycles of poverty um, and and generational cycles of, of what their families have looked like. And they're doing something different. And so being able to see that community of, of girls and young women and then, you know, even the work we do around the country with the Survivor Leadership Institute and over 200 women um, as part of that and, and what they're doing around the country, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of us who are doing pretty good things and are living healthy lives and, and are being able to show that it is absolutely possible to get out, to be free, to, and, you know, and the freedom that we talk about a lot in the anti-trafficking movement is, is tough, right? There are struggles when you get out. And, but if you can push through that piece, if you can push through those first couple of years of, of struggling and the shame, and there is something on the other side of it. Um, and, and you get to that point and you think, I would never, ever go back not in a million years, not for a million dollars. 
um, that's not what I deserve anymore. And so I, I'm, I'm really proud of being able to kind of both role model that and to have created a community. I'm more proud of that, frankly, to have created a community of incredibly strong survivor leaders of, of women and girls who are kicking ass and taking names and, you know, are able to show the, the girls who are kind of growing up in GEMS that there is hope on the other side. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Anything else you, did I, I'm not sure if I... You ran the gamut of so many things in such a short period of time. Thank you so much. Um, we're just going to get a little bit of B-roll now. Do you want me to say anything about kind of um, what GEMS is doing now or... I feel like I didn't talk about gems enough. Were you good? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. You backed up. Sorry. That was awful. <laughs> One of them's an hour early, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You feel like you got what you need, though? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. No, I mean, that was, I was, I, I hope that's not how it comes yeah. across. I was saying, like, it shouldn't be that, right? Like, it shouldn't be, I, I, I don't believe in programs and organizations that are ultimately dependent and reliant upon their founder or one individual, right? Like, the Rachel Lloyd Project, like, but right, like, we have an organization that is about so much more than that and you know god forbid if something happened to me right the work continues i mean that's the if you're building an organization and write your name and your face and right is is all that it is and something happens to you or you leave what happens to the foundation of the organization So if it comes across like that in the editing, like, <laughs> let me know. Because I don't want think people thinking I started the Rachel Lloyd Project, because that's totally not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs>